An educational comedy. It's not a cause. Not a movement. It's not a social group you can slap a label on to. It's an idea. It's an intention. It's an intuition. A mindset in which reality can be explored. A genuine expression. A certain Critical thinking and imagination. To look inward upon ourselves. To better understand the external world around us. And yes, two egos are bound to be bruised. With our silly, strange, politically incorrect. Your common style of going about things. Real, Real and raw honesty. honesty. Which invites you. To be you to the fullest. As Ron said, my name is Paul Roy. I just moved back to the United States. I've been living in Costa Rica for the past half of a decade. Things have changed a lot since I came back. Yeah, I wasn't here for 2008. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my portfolio went, but I didn't notice. Yeah. So I just I want to thank you guys so much for having me. I, I came back to the United States specifically to do public speaking. I realized that I'd been kind of running from myself. I had always known that this was what I was supposed to do. Have you ever felt that you just weren't worthy to be doing something? That you know that in your heart who you are, and that you just don't think that you're that you're good enough for it. That was me. That was me running down in Costa Rica. I lived up on top of a mountain. Didn't have a Facebook page. <laughs> lived with dogs and hippies in a goat shack. <laughs> Life is looking up a little bit right now. It's pretty cool. So yeah, once again, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you guys for being Rotarians. It's, it's really special to see just how many people care about their community. Just how many people love to serve. It's really, really special to me. And this is exactly the kind of group I love to address. I'm here today to talk to you about leadership. I only have a podium, so I get to put my notes over there and like <laughs> maybe over here pontificating. <laughs> but I'll just carry my notes this time around. <laughs> my mission is to develop leaders. When I was down in Costa Rica, I saw lots and lots of people. I saw missionaries, people in secular groups. And their desire, their true desire was to go down there, help people, raise people up. And they failed at it. They failed miserably because they didn't have any leadership skills. I remember that there was this little town close to where I lived. And in this town, the major source of the economy was people who sold their children. That was, the, that was how they made money. It's an ugly truth that that sort of thing exists in the world. And over the course of about 10 years, many people had come down there. They had tried so hard to change that to help lift these people out of poverty, to help them to understand that there was a better way. And all of these people, even though their cause was really good, couldn't get anybody behind them because they didn't have a single piece of leadership skill. Well, about three years before I left Costa Rica, a very strong leader came in. And this was a person who was unlikely to succeed. They didn't have the backing. They didn't speak the language that well. They didn't know the community. But because they were a good leader, they were the one who was able to lift this town out of poverty. Within three months, they succeeded in doing what 10 people had done over the course of 10 years, but they had not been able to do. So that's why leadership is so important to me. That's why I'm here to talk about it. Leadership is always new. There's always something fun to do. There's always something interesting, some new way that you're stretching yourself as a leader. It's easy to be mediocre. It's not easy to be a leader. It's not easy to be here in this room where you guys are right now. Because you guys take risks to be here. You could be out running your business right now. You could be out prospecting, prospecting customers. You could be out earning money. And you're here right now. You're, you're here to give back. The free lunch that you're getting is not in any way, shape, or form worth what you, your time is worth. It's not free. Yeah, <laughs> and it's not free. It's just free for me. <laughs> I believe that. I believe that. Yeah. So the best leaders are always learning. That's why I'm here. I'm here to teach you some things from my perspective. I've lived a bit of a unique life. I retired when I was 27. 
Everybody always asks me how I did it. I, I did it by investing in oil stocks when George W. Bush was elected. Worked out great. <laughs> yeah. Get one laugh out of that. Everybody <laughs> <laughs> else wanted to raise it. Yeah. But it's it was very interesting. So I it kinda happened by being lucky, but really what it gave me was a different life perspective because I got to see what the U.S. looked like from outside the U.S. and I got to see what it was like to live abroad for an extended period of time and, and be in a different culture and watch how other people live their lives. So I'm, today I'm going to share three topics that are really important to me that are designed to help you become a more effective leader. The first one is that all leaders communicate differently than the people around them and all great leaders communicate differently than mediocre leaders. So I'm going to teach you what separates the truly effective from the ineffective. There's one character trait that every single leader has. I'm going to tell you what it is and how to develop it in yourself. And finally, I'm going to take it back to the rotary connection, which is that leadership is service. I always start these things off, unless I'm rambling, by talking about a friend of mine named Joe. Joe was a young man that I worked with about 10 years ago when I was in the working world. He was quiet, artistic, always doodling on everything. He would doodle on our machinery, I'd have to write him up for it. He'd doodle on door frames. And... <coughs> he wasn't much of a leader. He wasn't what anybody would think, hey, look at this person, he's, he's going to go off and he's going to do great things with his life. But inside of Joe, this passion burned. And in one of his Moments with me when we were talking as a supervisor and employees generally tend to do sometimes. He told me that he really wanted to help people. He wanted to, he wanted to make their lives better. And when he was 22 years old, Joe did just that. He saved the lives of five men. And he helped two other people to see. Of course, he died in the process. Joe was an organ donor. He had epilepsy. And one day he had a seizure and just fell down the wrong way and <sighs> had a problem with his brain as the oxygen just didn't get there. However, through his sacrifice, he was able to positively impact the lives of five people and two more. Now people think that I'm going to tell a story about Joe, but it's really not about him. The story is about his mother. See, after Joe died, his mother had to go and take Joe's two cars down to the Colorado Department of Motor Vehicles. Can you imagine what it's like for a mother whose son just died to go down to the DMV? I don't want to go down to the DMV when I'm perfectly healthy. I don't want to go down to the DMV when I just had a party thrown in my honor. She, here she's doing it, and she's in pain. And all that she wanted was to get a license plate for her son, a license plate to honor organ donation. There wasn't one. The state of Colorado had 122 license plates, but not a single one to honor people who make that check mark on their driver's license application. You can get one to save greyhounds. What's that have to do with driving? <laughs> she could have gotten angry. She could have gotten sad. She could have gotten depressed, gone home, gotten a bottle. But instead, she got determined. She asked the question that I've seen all great leaders ask, which is, what would it take? She said, what would it take for there to become a license plate. What are the processes? What are the steps? And they told her what they were. She found and partnered with a nonprofit. She raised 3,000 necessary signatures with family and friends. She spoke to the legislature. Then she spoke to the Senate to get this passed through committee. She became a political leader. She became an advocate. And this was a woman who before the day that her son died, admitted to me that she couldn't stand in front of a kindergarten class without her knees knocking together. This was a woman who was without direction in her life. She didn't know what she wanted. She didn't know where she was going. She was coming out of a bad relationship. But what changed in her? The only thing that changed was that she got a reason. She had a reason to do what she did. She had a reason to lead. When you lead people, you need to tell them why they need to follow you. You don't need to tell them what they should be doing. You don't need to tell them how you're going to do it. You don't even know how you're going to do it. 
let's face it, you guys are all in business. Did your plans come out exactly the way you thought they would? Did your business happen the way you thought it would? Mine sure didn't. The businesses that I thought were gonna be successful went right into the ground, and the ones that were totally unlikely just shot up in value. I didn't even know that I was gonna be here today until two and a half hours ago. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks for being on. <laughs> yeah. So she had a reason to change. She grew into that leadership role. She grew into that success. She wanted to mm -hmm. honor her son because she could feel the person who got her son's lungs, she could feel him breathe, and she knew that a little part of him was still alive. It's beautiful. And it's important to understand. If you're going to lead anybody, even the most unlikely person can be a leader, and all they need to know is why they're doing it. It's what separates effective leaders from ineffective leaders. Ineffective leaders tell you what to do. They tell you how to do it. They tell you when to do it. They tell you how to do it. They don't tell you why to do it. They never tell you why. If you look at all the most effective leaders in history, they tell you why. Has anybody here had heard the Martin Luther King, I have a three-point plan speech? <laughs> I didn't hear that one either. <laughs> he had a dream. People cared about his dream. They didn't care about his plan. He wasn't even a great planner. He was a great dreamer, though. They cared about his dream. And they'll care about your dream, too, if you tell people why it's important. I've seen it in little things. I've seen it in charity. I've seen it in philanthropy. I've seen it in business. I've seen it in military stuff. You tell somebody why to follow you, and they'll follow you. I touched on it briefly, but I just came back to the United States. My, my bills went from being $200 a month living in Costa Rica to, I think my car insurance is $200 a month now. <laughs> and one of the first things that I did when I came back to the US is I thought, I should probably find a way to make money, because otherwise I'm going to live in a box. And I dress too nicely to live in a box. <laughs> and I started thinking about what it is that I wanted to do. I thought, I like to help people with their finances. I want to help people to grow financially. I started looking at financial service companies, and I interviewed at a ton of them, and I got offered jobs that I thought that I must be clinically insane to turn down, because there was always something missing. And that something that was missing, I discovered later, was that they didn't have a reason. They would tell me about their compensation plan. They would tell me about all the amazing money that I would earn, but they never told me why they would do it. So when I finally found a company that started with why they do it, I thought, well, I can, I can get behind that vision. <clears throat> the company that I eventually signed papers with did not offer me the most money. They did not have the nicest office. They did not have the nicest compensation plan. They do not have the nicest advertising. What they do have is a vision that's cohesive with my own, and that's why I let them lead me. So on January 1st, 2010, the state of Colorado introduced the Donate Life license plate. This was two years to the day of her son's death. The same year, Joe was honored on the Rose Bowl Parade float for Donate Life in a florograph, which is a picture that's made out of flowers, which I think is pretty cool. I want one of those. <laughs> that would be neat. Yeah. It was because of her efforts and the efforts of the people who followed her, over 67% of Coloradans have now checked yes for life. That's the highest in the nation. It all started with one woman and a reason. One very unlikely woman and a reason. She had something else as well. She had this one character trait that every great leader possesses and that every inefficient leader and ineffective leader has not yet developed in themselves. I had to leave the country to figure out what it was. It took me 32 years to figure out what it was. I mentioned before I was 27, I was retired, I was living in Costa Rica with other people who had bought oil stock. And my lifeline to the United States was this little piece of plastic, it's about that big, a TM card. Because I can't work, I'm a tourist. I could own a business, and I did. But my lifeline, my true lifeline, was my ATM card. And one day, my ATM card stopped working. <laughs> Ever had that situation? It's really inconvenient. <laughs> Let me tell you how inconvenient it is when the nearest bank branch is 6,000 miles north of you. <laughs> it's really, really bad news. 
I was running a restaurant. My restaurant was kind of making a little bit of money, but not really. I spent the last six, year, or six months of my life trying to make this thing work. And I always knew that if I didn't, couldn't make payroll, I could just go to the ATM. The ATM's got my back. Just pull money out, no problem. Well, that didn't happen anymore because I called my bank and I said, what can we do to fix this? And they said, just come into a local branch, sign this signature card. <laughs> It'll all go away. You'll get your ATM card turned on again. And I said, well, what if the branch is 6,000 miles north of me and you took all my money, so I'm going to have to walk? And they said, well, we can't help you. It's going to take three weeks at least to solve this problem. Well, that's a, that was an issue for me because payroll was due in two days, and I didn't have the money to pay it. And taxes were due in five days, and I didn't have the money to pay it. And the electricity, which is really expensive in Costa Rica, was due, and I didn't have the money to pay that either. And I was in a bind. So I got something. This thing started to exist in me that had never existed before. And it's faith. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about going to church. I'm not talking about God. I'm talking about faith. Faith in your own abilities. Faith that you can do it. Faith that what you're doing is right. I got faith really fast when I started to realize that even though I didn't have access to any of my money, all of a sudden my creative brain kicked in and I figured out how to sell more hamburgers fast. For the first six months of my business, I had spent $30,000, which is the rough equivalent of $300,000 in the U.S. I had spent about $30,000 on this restaurant and failed miserably at it. In the next week, I spent nothing and I managed to turn it around because my safety net was gone. I had to have faith in myself. I had to have faith that I could do it. I had to have faith that my ideas were good. I had to take risks because it was either take a risk or definitely not make payroll. It was either take a risk or definitely not pay my taxes. Definitely get booted out of Costa Rica, which I liked living there. I didn't want to get kicked out for non-payment of taxes. So I developed faith. And as a leader, you also have to develop faith. You have to believe that your vision is already real. Because if it's real up here, and you believe that it's real up here long enough, it will eventually be real out here. And you have to believe that. Because if you don't believe it, nobody's going to follow you. The people who failed at running charities in Costa Rica were people who did not believe that they could do it. They said, well, we might be able to do it if we get $10,000. I might be able to do it if I get 50 signatures, if we get the mayor on board, if the Chamber of Commerce agrees with me. We might be able to do it. The people who were really effective were the people who believed in themselves. They believed that it was already there. They talked as if it already existed. They made actions as if it already existed, as if it was already real. And it's so important to understand that you need to have faith, not just in yourself, but in your vision, whatever it is. Rotary started with just a few people on a small vision. And look what they've created. I don't think that anybody in this room personally knows any of the founders of Rotary. But their vision, they felt that it was real. And they, they knew, before they even started it, that one day something like this would exist, that someday local clubs would exist that would serve their local communities. So it's so important that you have the vision, that you have the faith, that you believe in what you're doing. Because if you don't believe in what you're doing, I'm not going to believe in what you're doing either. Are you a business owner? If you are, you need to believe that you've already crushed your competition. Are you in politics? Your opponent is already defeated. Are you doing a charity? then what you want to affect in the world has already taken place. <coughs> and you just continue to take small steps, small actions every day to bring it into reality. So how do you develop faith? You do it by stepping outside of your comfort zone and then surprising yourself <coughs> with how good you are. That's how you do it. You step outside of your comfort zone I'm outside of my comfort zone right now. I normally take two days to prepare for a speech. I sit, I say it in the shower. <laughs> I say it in the bathtub. I say it to my wife until she wants to kill me. 
Ron called me two and a half hours ago. He says, hey, I need you to speak at Rotary. Can you do it? Yes, sir. I can do it. Did I know that I could do it? Well, not until I'm done. I have faith that I could do it. I'm outside of my comfort zone right now. And it's so powerful to be outside your comfort zone because not only am I demonstrating to myself that something that I didn't know is possible is possible, I'm demonstrating it to other people too by my actions. So step outside your comfort zone consistently. When your comfort zone gets bigger, step outside it again. This is the secret to all successful people. They just keep scaring themselves. <laughs> <laughs> You've already done this. You wouldn't be here if you were ordinary. You wouldn't be here if you were just content with the work a day, 40 hour work week, retire at 65 thing. Would you be in Rotary Club at noon on a Thursday? No, you'd be at work. You would have your boss telling you when you can and can't come places and do things. You're here because you're already special. You're already outside your comfort zone. Every one of you has already taken that leap of faith at least once. That's how you got here. That's how you're doing this. So in a way, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. Because you guys have already done it. When I first got into speaking, I very quickly learned that there's a lot of speakers out there who are very self-serving. <coughs> they go in front of a crowd and they want to sell something. They got something to sell. Boy, do they want to sell it. Feels icky and gross. They've lost the crowd before they even get them. As soon as they walk up on the stage, hi, I'm here to sell you whatever. Oh, crowd's gone. They don't want to listen to what that person has to say. They don't care. Nobody wants to care about somebody who's self-serving. So it's, it's really nice to see that I'm with so many people here who are interested in serving others. See, that's the, that's why you're a Rotarian. I respect Rotary so much because I don't know how many of you have left the country. I know Joe has, but every single place that I've been in the world, I've seen at least one Rotary sign. In the slums, I see these dark clouds of poverty and illness and sickness and disease. And then I see a little bright spot, and right in that bright spot, there's a rotary sign. All over the world, I see this. People in their individual clubs, helping out, doing what they can in their local communities. I respect rotary so much. It, I mean, I'm so honored to be here. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. <clears throat> Do you want to be a more effective leader? Then just learn to serve. Leaders are servants. A lot of people in the U.S. Have, do not have the privilege of having personal servants, but when you leave the U.S., it's pretty common. Everybody, if you're lower middle income or better, you have a personal servant. At the very least, a gardener. Some people have a gardener, maid, cook. I learned a lot about leadership from watching my servants. I had a gardener. I had a cook. I had somebody who brought me coffee. None of these people cost all that much money. Time is not valuable in an economy when nobody has any money. The best servants were the ones that took care of my needs. The best servants were the ones who cared about me. The best servants were the ones who loved me. And I, turned, in turn, loved them back. They're the best servants. Well, the best leaders do the same thing. The best leaders care about you more than you care about you. The best leaders love you. They want to develop you. They see something inside of you that you don't even see in yourself. My very first mentor was somebody who only said a couple of valuable words to me before he exited my life. And he said, Paul, you're better than what you're doing right now. And you can make a simple change. You're smart enough to do it. And I, I was a loser when he was talking to me. I had no money. I had just gotten fired from a job. And he, and he looked at me and he said, Paul, you're, you're better than that. You think I'd follow that man? I'd follow that man to the end of the earth. He told me nice things about myself. And he caused me to understand these things about myself that I didn't know before. See, a good leader sees gems inside of each person, and they, they work diligently, and it is work. And they mine those things out. It is work. And when they're out, they just 
hold them up and they polish them and they hold them in front of the person and they say, look what was inside of you. Look how beautiful you are. Look at what you didn't even know existed in you. You think the leader does this for themselves? No, they do it for the person that they're serving. Leaders are servants, first and foremost. If you, if you lead by serving, you're going to find that you have a lot of followers and quickly. So make it your business to serve people. Make it your business to love people. Before I get in front of any crowd, the first thing I do is I look at them and I say, what do I like about these people? What do I like about them? And you should do that too. When you get in front of your employees, what do I like about them? When you get in front of your customers, what do I like about them? When you get in front of the people you think are going to vote for you, what do I like about these people? And speak from that place. Lead from that place. How can I serve them? How can I help them? It's so important. You want to be a truly effective leader? Learn how to be a truly effective follower first. Learn how to be a truly effective servant. Learn how to meet their needs. So, I guess I'll close it up by saying, start with why. Don't start with what, how, who, or when. Nobody cares. Start with why. Develop faith in yourself. And develop faith in yourself by stepping outside of your comfort zone. And finally, leaders are servants. And don't ever forget about that. If you, if you serve first, people will follow you because they will believe in you. First, believe in them. Remember my friend Joe? When he was in first grade, he wrote a poem that he probably did not think would be presented to audiences all over the nation. <laughs> he said, I think I'd rather be the sun that shines so big and bright than be the moon that shines because of someone else's light. I see the light inside every one of you guys, and I just want you to go out there and shine. Thank you. It's been an honor for you.